All righty. We are live on video. We are live on audio. We have a live Andrea Smith. Are you ready to go? Ready to rock. Here we go. Support for the Daily Tech News Show is provided by Patreons like you at patreon.com slash ace detect. This is FPN, the Frog Pants Network. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, September 16th, 2014. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me today, I'm happy to have Andrea Smith, technology journalist, back on the show. Fresh, well, as fresh as one gets with jet lag, as I can attest, uh, from Europe, where you were cover, you were over there covering IFA, and then you got some time to tour around. Uh, so we're going to be talking about traveling with mobile data later on. Excellent. Glad to be here. Wide awake, I hope. I think I think we're both in that same state of like almost back on our schedule. Right, right. Uh, Fuzzy. Yeah, yeah. Let's start off with some headlines. Cult of Mac says it has talked to folks inside Apple who say that the NFC chip on both the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus will only be used by Apple Pay. That's actually similar to what Touch ID uh, was like when it first launched. It was not accessible to developers at launch. Touch ID has opened up a bit in iOS 8, and many hope that the iPhone's NFC will open up to developers down the road as well, but not at launch. But didn't they show, and again, I was away when, for this, but didn't they show it working with other things like a hotel room? With the uh, with the watch, yeah, they did. So apparently they might allow some folks who are close friends <laughs> uh, to get a little access here and there, maybe. I, I think they I think that it'll, it'll be exactly like Touch ID. They'll have a yeah. couple of things that they can do with it, and then next rev of the operating system, they'll allow some limited developer access. Yeah, agreed. Hey, you know how Microsoft says they're a productivity and platform company all the time? Well, PC Mag reports on a few new peripherals that fall on that productivity side of the equation. The most intriguing is the universal mobile keyboard that connects Bluetooth to Windows, but not just Windows, Android and iOS devices as well. It's coming to U.S. and Canada in October for 80 bucks. A new standalone Arc Touch Bluetooth mouse, it, mouth, mouse, not a mouth, it's not a Bluetooth mouse. It's a mouse. It's coming September 18th for 70 bucks. And the Microsoft Wireless Mobile Mouse 3500 is back with some fancy artwork this month for 30 bucks. And finally, a version of the Xbox One controller meant for Windows, which means it packs in a 9-foot USB to micro USB cable, essentially, uh, is going to be coming in November for 60 bucks. Now, most people are ex interested in this keyboard because it's available for Android and iOS, not just Windows. But, Andrea, you were saying you saw a very similar product at IFA. I did. So I was so interested when I saw the Microsoft announcement because last week at EFOR, or even two weeks ago now, Logitech introduced a very similar keyboard. It's called the Bluetooth multi-touch device. Uh, a little bigger form factor, but basically the same thing. There's a cradle. You can put your phone or your tablet in there. Um, there's a dial, and you switch between three devices. Works with Microsoft Windows, Chrome, Android, iOS, Mac, you name it. And uh, I think the price point was $50, and it seemed great to me because I'm always switching between all those devices. So, um, so this is interesting to see. Yeah, I think most people looked at this and thought, well, that's interesting, Microsoft being more cross-platform, which is kind of the new rallying cry under Satya Nadella. Uh, but it may be just as much competing with other keyboards in the marketplace than if Logitech's got a similar thing out there. Exactly, or just even listening to your user base and seeing how people are using your products and what they need to, to be more efficient. <laughs> Which I guess some people might say is also a new thing for Microsoft. <laughs> uh, $350 for a watch made by somebody from Apple that won't come until next year. We can do better. The unofficial Apple weblog reports the Misfit Flash, a new version of the Misfit, not only tells time, but tracks activity and sleep and syncs with the Misfit app on an iPhone. Now, it doesn't have apps, but it does run on an actual watch battery, so no recharging. It also comes in seven colors, is waterproof down to 30 meters, and costs you 50 bucks. It'll be available in stores in October, and you can pre-order starting today. Oh, and the company is led, in part, by former Apple CEO John Scully, uh, who's famous for running Steve Jobs off. Uh, so you even get a little Apple history if you have a Misfit. You have a Misfit, like the previous one? I do, actually. I've been a big fan of, uh, of the Misfit. I've talked to Sunny View, the other co-founder, many times, actually. I have my Misfit here. Um, my husband and I tracked our steps in Europe every day. Uh, at the end of the day, we could see how far we walked. And I really like it. Um, 
and I think that this is interesting. You know, a smartwatch gives you notifications, and, and you're going to pay more for that. But $50 for kind of, you know, a misfit that will do your fitness, your steps, and your sleep, because so many people really do want to get a little bit more data about how am I sleeping? Is it deep? Is it light? Uh, what's interesting to me, and I've used all of these devices, I like the Misfit. They already make, you know, a band to go with the Misfit, and it's so I'm presuming that, that the flash that's coming out is going to be very similar to this, very soft and very comfortable. And so for people who want to wear this to sleep, it's much more comfortable than maybe the Jawbone Up 24, you know, which is a little more clunky on your yeah. wrist. I think 50 bucks is a great price point for this. No, there's, there, especially at that price point, there's nothing not to like about yeah. this. And if I mean, you're saying it works. Well, it's not going to be, you know, like the Asus Zen watch, right. which I thought was really slick looking. And we don't uh, know what the price of the solid gold Apple, I don't know if it's solid gold, but the, the gold uh, Apple watch is going to be. Mm -hmm. Can't be solid gold because then the uh, silicon chip would would have to be gold. I don't think that works. Uh, Reuters reports the U.S. Federal Circuit Court of Appeals in Washington threw out a jury order that would have required Apple to pay pay Vernet X, a holding corp. $368.2 million for VPN patents. The decision does not find Apple innocent of infringing the patents, but determined that the trial judge incorrectly instructed jurors on how to calculate damages. Essentially, it means that the damages were too much. The appeals court returned the case to the U.S. District Court in Tyler, Texas, for further proceedings. E-Week has it that Docker, maker of the open-source container virtualization tech, closed a $40 million Series C round of funding. Now, that funding is a big vote of confidence for Docker 1.0, which is yet to come out, but it's coming soon, and will create a commercial ecosystem around the technology. Docker is the one that lets developers build their app in any language. Then you put them in the Docker container and allows them to run anywhere. It's actually really good for sysadmins as well and loads of other things because it says you code however you want, and then your apps just run run wherever you put them. It's a lot more efficient than running them in a virtual machine, which has to do the entire machine every time. TechCrunch reports IBM has announced a new cloud application called Watson Analytics that will help business users crunch big data. A lot of sales applications here. And yes, IBM execs say the underlying technology includes the same ability to process natural language queries that helped Watson the giant supercomputer beat Ken Jennings at Jeopardy. So it's not just branding by calling it Watson Analytics. It goes into beta this month and is slated for general release by the end of the year. The program will run on a variety of platforms, including tablets, smartphones, and PC slash laptops. And there's a free version. It's a freemium model where you pay extra for extra storage and extra functions. Uh, I think this is a, I think this is a really probably the first application of Watson that feels like it's widespread, like a lot of businesses could take advantage of this. Yeah, and, and, and probably a lot of businesses will take advantage of it because they don't have really the bandwidth, you know, to, to do this kind of data crunching themselves. And there's so much that people are seeing that they can do if they have the answers. I think it said that, you know, rather than waiting months for, for trying to figure something out, that this would be much quicker, I guess, because of the cloud-based storage. But um, this is something that I think... I don't know the pricing or how companies will have to pay for the freemium for the extra storage or the premium for that matter. But uh, yeah, I think people will be using this. Yeah. Watson in the cloud. You know, you're, you're going to want to try it, especially if you're going to be on Jeopardy. You just put it on your, on your, on your smartwatch. <laughs> I'd like to try it. <laughs> well, well, is this available to, um, to mainstream users or just businesses, I wonder? You know, it's free, so I, I, you know, I'm sure they're they are definitely targeting it towards business users. But I imagine if you really wanted it, you could probably uh, you probably figure out how to try it out. So, uh, it'll be interesting to see what people do with this. This this is one of those things that might just end up being a very businessy enterprise application, and that's fine. Uh, but people might make some unusual uses out of it. Watson in a cloud. Time for some news from you. These come from our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. If you haven't checked it out, uh, go join the thousands of people, and I literally mean thousands of people, uh, that go in there and submit stories and vote on those stories. It helps us figure out what kind of stories you're into every day. Captain Kipper pointed out the Ars Technica article that a jury in Marshall, Texas, go Mavericks, found CBS guilty of infringing a patent from Personal Audio LLC. They're the guys that were suing podcasters, if you remember, and ordered CBS to pay $1.3 million. Now, Personal Audio holds a patent 
on a system for disseminating media content representing episodes in a serialized sequence. That's why they were going after podcasters. The patent was filed in 2009 and published February 17, 2012. What CBS did that the court found infringing was put a compilation file together, in this case, a web page made out of HTML, that's the compilation file, and then transmitted episodic content through that file over the internet. They updated it with new episodes. The decision allows personal audio to move forward with similar suits against NBC and Fox. Uh, meanwhile, the Electronic Frontier Foundation is challenging the validity of that patent with the patent office, and they're scheduled to have a hearing on that later this year. Who goes after podcasters, really? <laughs> well, Personal Audio apparently decided to drop their suits against podcasters because they figured there was more money in the networks. And they're right, $1.3 million. That's, you oh. know, that chump, I don't want to say it's chump change for CBS, but it's certainly something that CBS can afford. Whereas I can tell you right now, most podcasters can't afford $1.3 million. <laughs> TM204 submitted the Engadget report that security researcher Benjamin Daniel Musser discovered a security hole in the Manage Your Kindle page, a corrupted ebook, uh, for example, one that you don't get from the Kindle store, you downloaded from some other website, maybe it had a script hidden in the title, could be created to access your cookies and therefore give the attacker access to your Amazon account credentials. Musser discovered the hole in October. Amazon patched it, but the hole resurfaced recently after an overhaul of the Manager Kindle service. Musser says if you're careful about what ebooks you load into your Kindle and where you get them, it should be easy to avoid the problem. Gubert passes along The Verge report that Roku has sold more than 10 million streaming players since 2008. Apple announced earlier this year it had sold 20 million Apple TVs since 2007, if you want a comparison. Roku has now amassed 1,800 channels, and users have streamed more than 5 billion hours of content since the service launched. They currently sell a $49 Roku streaming stick and three set-top boxes, including the $99 Roku 3. And you know, that, I covered oh, yeah. Roku. I just have to say, I covered Roku since its launch. They have come such a long way from being the Netflix box. 1,800 channels. I mean, you know, that's a lot, and probably no one's ever going to watch half of them. But it means that there's something for everyone. And I have to tell you, for people like my mom, it's the easiest set-top box there is to use. You think it's easier than Apple TV? I do. Why is that? Yeah, um, I find it, uh, for her, it's easier because she knows how to navigate it. And I think the user interface, uh, I think last year when they redid that user interface, it just put it into such a simpler form mm -hmm. of, of uh, navigation. Um, I'm fine with Apple TV, but for an older person who's not as tech savvy, I think Roku is easier. I tell you what, I love my Roku too. And I, I use the Apple TV as well. Uh, I kind of go back and forth. The difference is Roku does allow the apps to make their own interfaces. They don't have to use a default interface like Apple does, which can go good or bad, but a lot of times goes very well. The, the Netflix app on Roku is miles better than the Netflix app on Apple TV, for example, because of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. For people who just use a few channels, I think it's, it's far, uh, far more convenient. I'm telling you too, Roku with their app store and trying to get involved in, in being installed inside of televisions, if we end up seeing Sony, Verizon, and maybe Dish launching internet only TV services next, mid next year, which it looks like we might, uh, Roku could be in a really b good position to take off yeah. uh, if they were able to get those services. And they already have the Dish World service. So yeah. they've got a good relationship with Dish there. And that is a look at the headlines. Uh, real quickly, I mentioned this yesterday on the show, uh, but I published a silly little no novella, it's self-published, called Events of a Different Nature. Uh, it's about my dogs solving crimes. It is not nearly as cute as that might sound, uh, though I tried to make it more Raymond Chandler than Wind in the Willows. Uh, they never once admit their dogs or in any way inferior to humans. Uh, so if you if, if you want to check it out, uh, you can find a free version as well as print and uh, various ebook platform versions at tommeritbooks.com. I had a lot of fun writing it. Uh, and, I, and a couple people who've read it so far said they enjoyed it. So it might be, might be worth a look, tommeritbooks.com. All right, traveling, mobile data. Uh, you were traveling in uh, Germany and Austria. I was traveling in Italy recently. Uh, we both had some similar experiences, uh, but also some different experiences. Let me tell you what I did, Andrea, and then tell me what you think of that and tell me what you did. How's that sound? Sounds good. 
Uh, well, my wife has T-Mobile, so she just did the, uh, the, I can't remember what it's called, the Simple Global Global. plan. Yeah, so she's just like, I'm just going to take my phone and go. That, in on the face of it, is probably the best way to go because you don't have to do anything. You've got your same phone number, you've got your same phone, you've got all your apps, and you just go and use it. Uh, Problem is you only get the 2G service, not the 3G service. And she found that the coverage in Italy was it was it was okay. Uh, she had to reboot her phone a couple of times too to make sure she got a better connection. What I did was I went and I paid what is probably too much, but still a heck of a lot cheaper than paying the carriers. Uh, I paid ninety nine dollars for a gigabyte SIM from JT Global there in Jersey. The benefit of that is that I got the SIM card ahead of time so I knew it would work. I could put it in my phone ahead of time, which I didn't do. And then when I tried to put it on the plane, I didn't have a paper clip. <laughs> so I had to wait till I got to the hotel room. But even then, I didn't want to have to stop in a store. Uh, and I know I could have saved a ton of money if I did that. But I was like, I want to know that it's going to work. I want to know when I go there that I can. I don't have to go and talk to somebody and try to figure something out. I can just put it in and go. And it worked that way. The other thing about JT Global is they have roaming agreements with lots of different providers. So it wasn't like going to Tim, say, in, in Italy and getting their SIM and only being on their network. I was able to jump from network to network. That worked out really well. Uh, but again, it was 10 cents a megabyte. So it was a little pricey. What did you find? So I found, it's interesting. So I I also was doing the T-Mobile. I wanted to try the T-Mobile Simple Global. I was a little nervous because T-Mobile here in my area is really bad. Coverage is not good. Uh, And I was a little bit nervous about how that was going to be for covering a tech show. Um, So what I did was I also got uh, from XCOM Global their mobile hotspots. Uh, And what they do is you rent a mobile hotspot. You tell them where you're going. And they either send you a European one or country specific. So in my case, they found that uh, since I was going to both Germany and Austria, they sent me two different ones. Mm. Uh, And they were slated to be turned on on certain dates and turned off on certain dates. Came in with a spare battery, um, really simple to use. It arrives the day before I left and came with a prepaid package for me to send it back the day after I got back. Um, so what was interesting for me is the T-Mobile over there was fabulous because it's Deutsche Telekom in Germany and it's the primary network. Duh, I didn't think about that. Right. People don't know Deutsche Telekom owns T-Mobile USA and they own the T-Mobile brand in Europe as well. So it makes sense. Exactly. So that's, that's like what you want to have over there in Germany. Uh, I never had any problem with coverage and I never had any problem with 2G. I was using it for email. I was using it for maps, you know, Google Maps walking around town. Uh, And in fact, I found that to be really great. The only problem I had, and I didn't think about this beforehand, was uh, like Twitter two-factor authentication. When I went to sign in on a device uh, that I hadn't signed in on, Twitter wanted to text me my code. Well, guess what? That wasn't happening on the T-Mobile device because it wasn't my normal phone. Didn't think about that. Probably beforehand, I could have gone in and said, email me my code if I asked for it as opposed to text. Um, That wasn't major. But since I then was traveling with my husband after the IFA show, the XCOM Global was great because, well, you can put up to 10 devices on that. So whereas I couldn't uh, easily tether the 2G T-Mobile phone, when we were walking around Vienna, we both had coverage. Uh, We were both able to do things. I was able to upload videos when I was trying to finish working so that I could get on with vacation. So I would say, you know, they were both really good experiences for different things. Now, I will tell you some people I was traveling with, um, Ed Bott from ZDNet just published a great article on his experience with uh, prepaid SIMs. Um, He had just a, a good experience and showed really how much money you can save by getting one of these local SIMs. Because if you're looking at adding international data texting and calling to your AT&T plan, that's going to run like $600, $700. Um, And you can get, I had another person we were traveling with bought for, I think, 9 or 10 euro, which is like $13, a 500 megabyte SIM. Now, in all, I looked at my phone, I think I used about 550 megabytes in the eight days I was there. So, you know, lots of options. I I used like 920 megabytes. And I guess I was sort of trying to, uh, mm-hmm. but but yeah, I was. It was nice to have a gig because I just didn't think about it, especially in those earlier days. And 
they had Wi-Fi on the train. It was slow, but it worked. We had Wi-Fi in our hotels. Uh, there were Wi-Fi in a lot of restaurants. I don't know if you noticed that in the areas you were in, but yeah. there were plenty of places where you could just get on Wi-Fi if you trust it uh, and, and be able to avoid having to use your mobile data there. Exactly. And there's a lot of Wi-Fi. Uh, interestingly, you know, for me, I thought the XCOM Global made it more secure. You know, I knew that it was secure what I was doing and I wasn't worried about it if I was working or doing anything that was sensitive. Um, but the other interesting thing I noticed this year in Europe is the hotel that we've stayed at in previous years, which used to charge $20 a day for Wi-Fi um, and give you one hour a day free if you wanted was free the whole time we were there. I mean, it was throttled. It wasn't really, you know, fabulous Wi-Fi, but it was enough for me to work from the hotel room, and it was free. So I hope that that's a trend of hotels, you know, stopping this ridiculous charge for Wi-Fi. Yeah. One of the places we stayed at had free Wi-Fi, but it was very obvious they had one router. And so depending on how many people were using it at any time, it was either unusable or, or super fast. Uh, another hotel had a decent charge. It was like $15 for multiple devices per day, which I still don't want to pay for that, but it's better than it used to be where they'd charge you like $35 a day. Uh, right, one and, device. And, and it had a limit of two devices. They said multiple devices, and then we tried to authorize a third device, and they're like, oh, nope, you've gone over your limit. And worst part about that was not only had we gone over the limit, but it wasn't even an option to pay for more if you wanted to. I'm not sure I would have anyway, but it was like, nope, you're screwed. You authorized two devices. Those are the two devices you get to use for the next 24 hours. You're done. Well, you know, interestingly, another option is Boingo, um, which last year I found to be very uh, easy over in Europe. The hotel we were staying at that was charging $20 a day had a Boingo Wi-Fi hotspot, so I just used Boingo. Mm -hmm. And Boingo's great because you can sign up for one month and then drop it. You don't have to have a, a contract or a plan. This year there were fewer Boingo hotspots, and I'm not sure if there's any correlation between fewer of those and better uh, better access to hotel Wi-Fi, I'm not sure. Mm. Um, you know, in all, I would say that the whole prepaid SIM thing in, in talking to everyone, there's so many options with that where you can use some of your data, you can save some for calls, um, and there's a wiki, there's a, a prepaid SIM wiki that you can go to that answers all these questions. It's all in Edbot's article. Yeah, we'll have a link to that article in our show notes as well. Uh, I, di I did a... a uh, an audio extra for the patrons on Sunday where I talked a little bit about this and we got some good responses from folks in the audience uh, with some other ideas. Rafal suggested if you're not on T-Mobile, you can get a T-Mobile postpaid phone. Uh, $50 unlimited data. It is still a 2G, but he's like, you can get a free, you can sometimes get a free phone or a really cheap phone if you just want to have that data and not have to deal with SIM cards. Uh, Wilton warns that T-Mobile coverage is not good everywhere. He lives in Baja, California, and recommends Telcel there, and T-Mobile only roams with movie stars. So it's going to depend on the roaming agreements, depending on where you go. Uh, Jason M. says Tim in Italy offers a 9 euro card for unlimited data for a month. Uh, yeah. Again, you're limited to where Tim has its roaming agreements, but man, if you're just trying to save money, that's, that's incredibly that's, cheap. Yes. Uh, Paul notes that uh, roaming from place to place can cause problems with SIMs from one telco, uh, as I mentioned, essentially. If you if you just have a SIM from, say, Tim or, some, or Vodafone, uh, you may not have as good a service in one place or another. And that's why I liked the JT Global, is they would roam on anything. So that it was a little more expensive, but I always knew I was going to get service as long as somebody had service in that location. Uh, and Robert suggests just buy a new phone for temporary use. Sometimes you can get those burner phones that have data on them. Uh, that's another way to go as well. It all depends on how much money you're willing to spend and what your level of inconvenience is. Some people like me, like, you're on vacation, you don't want to go in a store and talk to a sales rep, especially in another language. Sometimes to refill these prepaid cards, you have to use the language that is the country that they're from. Uh, and, and so it might be worth a little more to, to buy something ahead of time. But it's certainly the cheapest option is and to just get one there. You want to know that it works. I mean, I, there was one person traveling with us who bought a SIM card, and it, you know, everything was fine, but he just couldn't get it to work. You know, it mm -hmm. just something was happening, and he, I think he wound up actually putting it in somebody else's phone just to get it started, and then put it back in his oh, phone. Really? It was fine. That's weird. Yeah. So I mean, when you're on vacation, you really don't want to have to deal with that. You just want it to work. 
And that's why the renting of the uh, the Wi-Fi hotspots is a, is a really smart idea as well. If all you want is data, if you're not worried about phone, you could actually just pay for a small plan for phone and text. That might even solve your uh, your uh, un your uh, two-factor authentication I issue. Yes. Not use it, keep the phone off most of the time, and then just rent a Wi-Fi hotspot or keep it in airplane mode and just use data that way. Lots, lots of ways to crack this. Unfortunately, uh, the easiest one is what T-Mobile does with the free roaming. It may not work 100% of the time, but that's the one I wish everybody had. Exactly. And, and you know, again, you know, it has to be in a good coverage area because you need to be able to depend on it. Right. But really and truly, the 2G was not an issue for me. Yeah, I was surprised at that. When Eileen did actually get service, her, her speeds were fine. <laughs> I think it was, I can't remember who said it in the chat room now. Somebody's like, yeah, because nobody in, is using 2G anymore. So. <laughs> so you had it all to yourself, maybe. I don't know. Uh, well, thank you, Andrea, uh, for, for sharing your experience. I hope that's helpful for folks. Uh, if are, are you working on a story on this yourself? or? Yeah, I'm going to just, you know, having take, having tried all these options, I'm going to work on a story on putting it all together. And uh, because, you know, people, even for me, when I went, I had to look at everything and say, what do I need to do? I hadn't thought about the two-factor authentication. Um, so, you know, just trying to see all the different options and get people covered. So check that out. Follow Andrea on Twitter. It's uh, it's just Andrea Smith on Twitter, Twitter right? Yep. Keep an eye out for that in the future. Let's check the calendar real quick. iOS 8 will be available to download tomorrow, September 17th. Some articles out there, as usual, say why you should or shouldn't do it. So you might want to check those out before you do. Uh, September 17th is also the start of Programmatic I.O., a web marketing conference in New York. Our pick of the day comes from Brian Burgess. It's an oldie but a goodie, D-Ban. He says, one of the free tools I use a lot, especially when I want to completely nuke a computer and do a real clean install of Windows, is Derek's Boot and Nuke. Good old DBAN at dban.org. Uh, if you want to blow away a drive that's heavily infected with viruses and other malicious code, it's also perfect for that. You burn it to a disk, boot from it, and use the command line interface. For most consumers, the quick or auto nuke option is good enough, but for the truly paranoid, uh, you can have your drive near Department of Defense standards, uh, and you can set it to overwrite the drive up to seven times. That's dban.org. I've been uh, I've been a fan of DBAN since. 2007, I think, is when I ran across them. Um, I think there's also a way to do this now otherwise, especially for folks who don't have a CD drive. Uh, and, but this, this is an oldie but a goodie, especially if you've got an older laptop you're getting rid of. You might want to check that out. You can send your picks to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com, and you can find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. All right, uh, Andrea's got an interesting take on the Minecraft acquisition from Microsoft. We got a couple other uh, takes on this as well from the audience. First one is a voicemail from RapidEye. Hey, Tom, RapidEye here. Uh, great addition to have and Patrick join the join the team. Uh, you guys have good chemistry together. Looking forward to all the shows to come. Um, one of the topics you're talking about today with Microsoft Minecraft. I guess my biggest concern is is Maybe they paid too much for a property that's past its prime and on its way out. Um, it's not so much that it's dead. I just think that, you know, maybe a year or so ago it was a little bit bigger than it is now. They paid for something that's that's not going to last, and, you know, and they're not going to get their money back out of it. They certainly have a history of doing this. They did this maybe 10, 15 years ago with Fossa and the Mech Warrior franchise. They paid a bunch of money for that. I think they released something on the Xbox, and then they just let it flounder, and, and I think they actually wound up spinning it off again. I, that part I'm not sure about. But in any case, they have a history of doing this. Uh, I don't know if it's good timing, bad timing. Pretty sure it's bad. All right. Take care. Love the show. <laughs> Rapid Eye thinks it's bad. We touched on that a little bit about whether Minecraft is peaked. I still, even if it is peaking, I think it's got many years left in it, and it may not have peaked. It may be a, more of a platform for them is what we were talking about yesterday. The other thing I mentioned yesterday is the money they paid for it came from Europe and stays in Europe, so they don't have to pay U.S. taxes on it. They'd have to pay a big tax hit if they brought that money back into the U.S. And Nate Langson of Wired.co.uk wrote in and said, just on the microcraft story from yesterday, another explanation for the purchase might be a really boring one. Spending two and a half billion on Minecraft might earn them more than that cash is earning them in the bank. It's a bit mad that dropping so much cash to earn a few tens of million a year might look good on paper, but it could make sense from an accountant's perspective. Just thought I'd suggest something dull to counterbalance your interesting theories from yesterday. It could always be a combination of all these ideas, and he's probably right. Uh, it probably is a combination of all these ideas. Andrea, I know you were interested in it from the, pro from the perspective of a parent. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a lot of money, and I don't know what they're going to do with it. But from from my perspective and what I've seen, Minecraft is one of those games, you know, there's so many games that, that parents don't want their kids to play. Minecraft is the one game that people keep saying, I want to learn how to play this so that I can play it with my kids. Parents approve of it, They, you know, unless, of course, it becomes an obsessive thing where it's happened and people have had to ban it as, as other uh, games. But I, this is one of those games that I think parents are okay with. You know, they really feel like their kids are um, learning something positive if they're using it properly and trying to figure out. I've seen countless articles about here's how to play Minecraft with your kids. Um, so, you know, I think it's got a lot of years left in it. Well, and TechnoSquid uh, wrote in and pointed out this could be Microsoft trying to get brand awareness with another generation. Uh, Microsoft may not have a lot of brand awareness with younger folks, but he says, I can't think of many Microsoft brands with which a young person could have a positive association, and that could be a serious long-term problem for them. With all of the use of Chromebooks and Google Apps and Classrooms, it seems like Microsoft is losing the future of their bread and butter revenue streams. Maybe this is their McDonald's strategy, like Ronald McDonald and the toy and the Happy Meal, ingraining those positive associations for life. Who knows? Today's Minecraft builders could be tomorrow's developers developers, developers. Uh, you know, I, that's a really good point. I mean, there really isn't something that sticks out for kids that's associated with Microsoft right now. And that's a great point. Yeah. Uh, it may, may sound a little bit uh, pragmatic, uh, you know, ver versus uh, hope for the future, but it could be both as well. I, I, you know, Justin Robert Young wrote in and was like, what about the idea of them buying Minecraft simply to boost the value of Xbox before they spin it off? And my response to him was, that works either way. Uh, if they keep it, it, it has now made a more diversified uh, segment of the company that doesn't rely simply on the fortunes of one console anymore, but that also makes it more valuable for sale. So I, I, I think... I don't think it points one way or another whether they're going to keep or get rid of the Xbox division. I think it's just a good move no matter what you do. Well, that is it uh, for this episode of the Daily Tech News Show. Thank you, Andrea, uh, as always, for joining us. Uh, let folks know a little bit more about what you're up to these days and where they can find you. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Andrea Smith. I'm working on uh, CES right now. Can you believe CES is almost here? Oh, man, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's about time to start thinking about it. You're right. Oh it's crazy. my gosh! Yeah. So some programming for CES, uh, some some live interviews there at CES, and um, you know, always a pleasure to join you. Thank you, Andrea. Good to have you. Thanks to all of our patrons who help make the show possible. Uh, 4,274 people have decided that they see some value in the show and they'd like to give some value back. If you have thought the same thing, uh, you can go to dailytechnewsshow.com slash donate to find out more. You can support us with all kinds of different ways, Patreon being the main way uh, that keeps the show going. So thank you very much to everybody out there who is supporting the show. Don't forget, you can have a voice in what stories we cover at our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com, email feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com, our phone number is 512 259 daily and you can listen to the show live at mobile.alphageekradio.com our website is dailytechnewsshow.com we'll be back tomorrow with michael wolf see you then this podcast is part of the frog pants studios network for more information about this and other shows visit frogpants.com audio program so good it's like you're there hey i love that voice <laughs> That's Scott Johnson. Oh my God, it sounds great. Yeah, he did a great job on that. I love that thing. People were singing it like when I was having the vague technical problems that I had last week. Your <laughs> guests would just start to sing it. It was Aww. fantastic. <laughs> That's great. It was. That. It made my day. <laughs> That's uh, nice. great show, guys. Fantastic. Thanks for having me, guys. Good. Yes, to see thanks, you. Andrea. Yeah. Good to have you back. That was awesome. See you again soon. All right. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. All I was thinking during that was things have changed since I went to Europe and there weren't really any cell phones at all. Well, when was the last time you went to Europe? Uh, well, I mean, look, I once I got back from Europe in nine. Well, no, I'm sorry. The, I should say the first time I went to Europe. Oh, uh, gotcha. Yeah. Statement. Um, about how much things have changed. Like, I remember the hunt for the internet cafe. Oh, look, an internet cafe. Let me insert my weird foreign money and I will write someone. We were talking about that too. The uh, We went to our friend's wedding in Hawaii 
uh, in 2001, I think, and had exactly that like, ooh, we need to find an internet cafe mm -hmm. so that we can check our Yahoo mail. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, it's, just, it's just crazy yeah. to think about. And then the last time we went to Europe was basically like, all we could do was a roaming plan because our phones were locked and it was constant like, okay, I'm gonna turn it on for the next five minutes and check my email mm -hmm. really quick and then turn it back, turn it back to airplane mode again. Mm -hmm. um, and my it's just favorite, so nice not to have to do that. My favorite part though about going to Europe was like when you went with a bunch of friends when you were younger and it was like, okay, we're splitting up. I will meet you in Aquitaine. Uh, you know, in in this church, in this thing, at this time, and it was like a real high stakes gamble over whether you were going to find your friends ever again. I feel like maybe that's been lost. Things that have been lost. But that was, I mean, you you can say that's been lost, but that's the same thing as saying like, you know, <laughs> with television, people don't sit down and talk in the evenings the radio. anymore. They don't listen to the radio anymore. Or with radio, they don't they don't <laughs> play music on the piano anymore. It's just yeah. we we always have new ways of doing things. Uh, it is no. crazy to think about like how much you had to go through to figure out how to meet that yes. you don't have to do anymore. Yep. Actually, I mean, that that hit me at one point when I I Eileen was actually in a store in the dressing room. I don't, but I went in to find her to tell her I was going to go somewhere else and I couldn't find her. And I'm like, well, she doesn't have oh, my no. phone number for the SIM card. I can't text her. And, and so I'm like, I, I got to stay here. I'm just going to have to wait until she comes out. Yeah. No, it's a weird, every once in a while you get in these weird things. Um, like that time that I was in Mississippi after Katrina and like we had to make whole plans on how to meet because like our phones just didn't. Yeah, work. yeah. Right. And like we were going between Gulfport and Biloxi, and it was like, well, if we miss each other, that's the CBS Evening News. <laughs> like, it's really, uh, it was quite a thing. Um, so anyway, there's there's that walk down 1999 memory lane. Um, but yeah, I think when I went to Barcelona with the phones, that was only, I want to say that was 2008. It wasn't that yeah. long ago. Yeah. It really has been a leaps and bounds. I haven't been in Europe since 2006, which is insane. Um, but that's that's another story for another day. Uh, well, I think we should send you to our Paris bureau then. Yay! <laughs> that would be great. I'm here. <laughs> um, actually, I want to go to Mobile World Congress. That's my dream. Let's go back really? to Barcelona. No. Yeah, yeah, going to Barcelona is my dream. <laughs> Oh, Congress uh, is fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's my that's my new my new bugaboo. Band of misfits. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, when in Rome. <laughs> I'd like that. That is not a Toby Pinder. That's the one. I think that's yeah. I think that's um, it. although I'm always a fan of Rome, if you want to, because it's a great song. Sure. Um, I think I've used that maybe a couple of times on different yeah. shows. It's hard to keep track. Although BioCow does have roaming data, which is pretty great. Yeah, that's Spelled good. Spelled like the city. Mm -hmm. The eternal city. Oh, that's the Vatican. It's the commune. Commune. De, de, actually, it's the Capitale now. They changed it. it used to be a commune. Capitale. I think... I think when in Rome is pretty great. Yeah, that's that's freaking brilliant. The one. <laughs> Watson, come here. I need you. It's not bad either. <laughs> <laughs> Watson, come here. I need you. Uh, Roman holiday. TVZ gone. Very nice. I hadn't got down that far. All right. I'm going to go to sleep and wake up when it's like November and the weather is cool again. I think I can take another month of this. So why can't you be in the air conditioning? So, well, I certainly can, which is the only reason I'm really still present right now and haven't run off to San Francisco. Uh, we have one air conditioner for the entire most of the house, and mm -hmm. then we have one in the bedroom. And so it's either like 
lock yourself in the little yellow walled submarine mm-hmm. or be kind of okay for all yeah, that. Yeah, I gotcha. You know, it's just, and then not really go outside because, like, where are all the damn movies? I'm, like, waiting for the movies to come back so I can go hide in the movie theater, but, um... Right. You know, there's no, like, and yes, you I don't, can go to You don't want to see Maze Runner? <laughs> you know, there's lots of things I could see. There certainly are movies present. Zero Theorem is getting really bad reviews on Rotten Tomatoes, and I was very sad about yeah. that. So I was, you know, I love a Terry Gilliam movie. There just doesn't seem to be a movie out that I'm super interested in until maybe Skeleton Twins or mm. definitely Gone Girl. Um, but that's a ways away. And well, it's supposed oh to get gosh. cool on this weekend anyway. Yeah, when cooler. All the oh, it's going to be down to 80. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> There's even a 10% chance of rain. Yeah. 10%. What? When it rained that other the other day for like five minutes, uh-huh. uh, you may have been away, but no, I don't remember that. Like, yeah, it was the most amazing thing, and then of course it ended. It ended. Oh well. Captain Kipper's going to Italy next spring. Oh, cool! So now he's armed with new data. Uh, many and he's doing Barcelona too. Wow, nice. Oh wow! Many messages came in while I was itching. I don't know when the next movie draft starts, 40 Thieves. That's a good question. I think we usually start it in October. So we'll have to do the draft pretty in the next couple of weeks, probably. I'm burned out. I'm burned out on the draft. <laughs> After one draft, you're burned out? Come I, uh, on. Matt and I were Josephson. so emotionally invested. And That's we why you so got to moderate. <laughs> you, gotta, you can't throw yourself all in like that. You burn, we you burn so yourself out. Close. Just needed one movie to do what it was supposed to do, and we've been fine. I've seen movie drafts, Jenny. <laughs> I know how that goes. I know. I, 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 and I just like when I look back, it's like that hindsight is twenty twenty <laughs> thing. Like when I look back at it, I think, oh my god, like, you know. Just, Why do you think I was sitting there going like, well, we'll probably I be know, on. I know. It's all defense mechanisms. I know. So I don't know. Maybe you have to go back to your original partner for this one, for the prestige well, draft. I, this was the first year we did partners. It's always been solo right. before. Yeah. So. I don't know. Well, I'll leave that decision to you. I, I love it. I think it's great. But boy, was it exhausting to care about. <laughs> you cared too much. I cared too much. Well, that's if I have really a fault. Love the damn movies. Yeah. Uh, oops, I'm not the subject. I'm the uh, creator. Mm-hmm. I am the creator of this content. Yep. I was putting in the wrong fields. Now that's good TV. People talking <laughs> about entering fields on a form. Yep. I'm trying to think of what else is going on, but literally there's almost nothing going on. You're like, all I can think about is heat. That's I'm all I can think house, about. I'm sitting very still. It's hard to watch TV because it's a big old TV and generates a bunch of heat. So, although I did, I did catch up on two seasons worth of Grey's Anatomy. Oh, wow. I never thought I'd watch again um, mm-hmm. just because, oh my God, there's been 10 seasons of it. But I'll tell you what, yeah. there's something to be said a quality one hour drama with really good actors. Eileen has kept watching that too. And I've watched it on and off with her over the years. I'm, I'm not, I don't care if I miss episodes, but every time I dip back in, I'm like, yeah, yeah they're doing the same yeah. show, but it's, it's at the same level. I haven't, yeah. they don't seem to have dropped off. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really, it is a, there aren't a lot of hour longs that have done these, you know, a decade of shows anymore, like barely they last. So um, that's, it is an accomplishment, something to be said. So that was yeah. my big, like, like I'm just going to watch these like a zombie <laughs> August. I, guess, I was going to say it's a modern day mash, but I guess it's more of a modern day ER. Yeah, it, it, that was the other thing too. So that got us talking about ER and Matt and I were like, do you remember, do you remember? And they were like, oh my God, we're old. Because, like, if ER was now the old thing, like... That's I why I was have, like, ugh. I can't... Because I, 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 I always think of Grey's Anatomy as being like ER. And I'm like, well, I can't say modern-day ER. ER is new. And then I'm like, hmm, 
No, Head, no, it's like, not. Don't you remember, like, thinking ER was, like, the gold goddamn standard of television, like, yesterday? You know, in terms of, like, that hour-long Yeah. It was, it was the thing that was always on. Yeah. I know. And now, like, ugh. Matt, I, Matt and I were comparing, like, uh, plot notes of what we remembered from ER, which was a fun game. Because, like, I remembered three things, and he remembered, like, several seasons worth of content. <laughs> I never actually watched it. CSI, yes, and Mike, you are absolutely correct. Oh, you never watched DR? No. Mm. Yeah, there were there were many many a show I missed in the in that time, but I happened to be around for around TV for ER. Yeah, I knew I knew of it, and I knew people who watched it. I ne- I had never watched an entire episode of Friends until two thousand one. I don't think. Wow. Uh, yeah, the nineties were lost for. <laughs> Yeah. Bones I, what did too. I watch? I watched Star Trek, Next mm-hmm. Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager. I watched all those in the 90s. Mm-hmm. I, don't really, I guess it's, that must be it. Did I watch yeah. anything else? Movies. I, I would, did go uh, see movies. Capped Kipper, St. Elsewhere and, and uh, Hill Street Blues were the, like, the, ge- the slight generation before the ER juggernaut. They were the mm-hmm. ones that were, like, quality hour-long drama renaissance they bridged the uh mash gap gap. yep yeah Yeah. especially for medical um there are great there are just great books about like the evolution of the golden age of television and like how many eras there were and blah 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 that are out now and it does a really good job of tracing that evolution it's really quite fantastic um yep thursday nights at 10 those were the good old days. Must when see ratings, Thursdays. When ratings were only for uh, one medium. It's pretty awesome. Um, if you are a writer of these shows, does that make you good at procedural generation? Yes, I pretty much believe that like writers of Castle can dream up an episode of Castle in their sleep. Um, it's just like, formula and you either apply the formula or you twist the formula or you you know do a a mockery of your own formula it's really quite um uh interesting to watch it unfold over several seasons by the way castle did one of the better episodes about time travel ever how about them apples and one of the best firefly references well, yeah. <laughs> Ever. Actually, many Ever? of those, but yeah. I'm particularly thinking of the Halloween one. Yeah, that was amazing. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, there is an episode of Castle from, I think, a recent season that perfectly pulled off a time travel story while also perfectly being plausible that it wasn't a time travel story. Ah, gotcha. They nailed it. It was so impressive. We Clever. saved it. Yeah. Well, I'm out of the post. All right. And... Um, I'm going to do three episodes of Sword and Laser later today. Oh, gosh. Well, have fun with that. (laughs) Uh, Um, So bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. See you in a bit.